first of all, we have to have the definition of reset correctly. Uh, reset cannot mean, we can't think of it in terms of sort of pushing a button and we're going back to the way things were. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Most, most prominently that we're a long way off from being able to go back to any kind of normal. And the normal was a crisis. The normal was itself not working. But what we never did in those responses and in all of the periods since World War II is adequately address the social contract, the enfranchisement of human beings around the world to be able to participate in a world that they, because of smartphones, can now see everywhere, but not participate in. That is a recipe for revolution, for anarchy. What you're seeing in the United States is a past due notice for the unpaid debts owed to black Americans for the last 401 years. This is policing always is the spark. Public safety is always just the spark. So if we restrict the conversation right now just to a conversation about how we reform or even reimagine public safety, we've missed the full scope of the moment. We're in a moment where it's possible for all of us to look at the debts, to do a full accounting for what is owed and start to do something that's proportional to that. The ways in which we enforce inequality with state violence, that's a global issue. And for folks who are leaders of corporates, you can drive that. You are in a position to demand that the, the countries where you do business have an accounting for the ways in which they've stolen labor to amass, amass wealth. That doesn't need to be seen as activist or controversial. When you do an injury, you have to pay a debt. When a company doesn't pay its debt, it goes into foreclosure. We understand this among people who have things. It's just there's so many people who don't, who don't have a political voice and certainly don't have a corporate voice, that they can't raise it to demand the things that all of the rest of us would require of a functioning society. First, they've got to actually enhance the skill sets of their own employees to remain relevant to be productive, to actually have a return such that they can contribute that to society. Otherwise, they can't exist, they can't be relevant, they won't perform well. And there's a great demand with the amount of transition that's happened, as uh, Secretary Kennedy, uh, Kerry said earlier, what COVID-19 did was nothing more than accelerate some of the changes we we're already seeing on the way. Second is you've got the bigger issue in terms of job opportunities. Is it going to be there and especially those that are displaced right now? So what does the business community do in that regard? And then on a societal basis, we've had education systems that are A, not useful, not productive, not effective, and we have millions and tens and hundreds of millions that don't have access to that opportunity for education. So the business community needs to step up. To your point on PwC, we're part of that challenge. We're hopefully part of that answer. I think three things have come together. So one thing is, I mean, immediately before the crisis, I was working um, in sort of so-called left behind communities with workers, um, manufacturers, grave diggers, uh, carers. Most workers already feel their lives are very precarious and that safety nets don't work. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we're facing huge unemployment. We know that unemployment is a relational issue. It doesn't affect everybody the same. It's going to fall according to race, according to age, according to class, and we have to think differently about that. And then the third thing I think is transition because we're facing an ecological catastrophe. So it isn't just about going back to work or working, it's about where are you working and how can we transition out of often very well paid, good jobs that are in kind of so called dirty industries into smart green work. If you see the biggest barrier to women in the workplace, it has been for a long time the imperative to be on site. Um, the 9 to 5 or 9 to 10 p.m., depending on the kind of jobs, etc. And here suddenly we're having to reinvent the workplace. And I really mean that. Right now, the biggest question of our workforce, and we have nearly 25,000 employees around the world, is how are we going to change our workplace because of what we've just lived? And everybody expects us to change that, not to go back to what it was. And those most excited about that change are actually the women. Uh, because they have sensed and they have lived more flexibility than they've ever had before. So there are a lot of, of positives. It's very peculiar and germane to our part of the world that 
If you take the United Arab Emirates, you've got maybe 90% of the population is not indigenous, but it's uh, expats or migrants. And the jobs that they have are everything. You know, you, your gas worker, your oil workers, the cab drivers, the nurses, the doctors, the plumbers. They have been very hardly hit by COVID because the way they live, the communities in where they live, um, have aided in the transmission of the disease. So they're very densely populated areas. Sometimes they're sharing, you know, nine people to an apartment. Question uh, uh, going forward is people are vital to your economy. Can you further protect them? The protection, as Secretary Kelly said earlier, we, we all have unfinished work to do. Uh, we need to examine whether we are going to do the things that will allow us to mitigate the next pandemic because the cost that COVID has brought upon the Gulf, like the rest of the world, is extremely high. So are we going to learn something from this or not? It's quite evident that you need a holistic, systemic and comprehensive response uh, uh, to uh, approach to response and, and, and rebuilding. And if you then put these together, you could say that actually being functional is, is about being prepared to anything in a really unpredictable world. That actually the strength of a functional city is that in a time of a crisis, you don't have a substantial need to change your processes. And actually that disruption to normal is, is minimal. The core of a functional city is that everything counts. So what we aim to be is to become and be safe, clean, resilient, smart, sustainable at the same time. So you really need a comprehensive approach to city management. It's about being predictable, reliable and, and fair for everyone equally. It's about a, a city that works in, in all circumstances. It's certainly true that part of the success of the city of, of Helsinki is that uh, people trust us, people trust the authorities. If we come with some restrictions or some recommendations, they actually really follow them.